Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Zero Trust Network Architecture, Applying the Best Principles to Modern Networks. I'm Megan Murphy, Marketing Assistant at Sectigo, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Presenting with us today, we have Sectigo's Chief Compliance Officer, Tim Callen. Hi, Tim. How are you? Hi, Megan. I'm doing great. Joining Tim will be CTO of PKI at Sectigo, Jason Sirocco. How's it going, Jason? Doing great, Megan. Great, great to be here. Now, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. All attendees will remain on mute for the duration of the webinar, which we expect to be around 30 minutes, allowing for 30 minutes for Q&A at the end. You'll be able to submit any questions you might have using the chat throughout the webinar. That's it for me. Without further ado, Tim, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Megan. And um, actually, I'm going to hand it over to Jason to take it away. Yeah, thanks, Tim. This is a, a subject uh, that you know, I think has been around in quite a long time, but there's certainly, certainly a lot of renewed interest in this. And, and we're going to get into the reasons why in a few more slides, but we, we've got to get into our own definition of what zero trust network architecture is. And certainly anybody who's attending this webinar, uh, you probably have seen a lot of talk about this subject. And I, before we even get to the first bullet point, I want to talk about this in terms of really a set of principles. I, th I think, Tim, just before this talk, you and I were, were, were talking through this subject. And yeah. one of the things I find kind of interesting about it is th there is no such thing as a zero trust network architecture solution that you just go up and buy off the shelf. It just doesn't right. exist. Right. And I, I think that in the context of Sectigo within this, uh, as, a, as a company that, that really concentrates on digital identities and PKI, I think that I wanted to put us in context of the worldview of the rest of how you implement the set of principles before we really get into the principles. Those of you who've looked at zero trust solutions, and you've perhaps searched that on the internet, you've probably seen a lot of talk by firewall companies, obviously, because if you're segmenting your network, uh, they have a lot to say about that. If you are doing a lot of authorization rule sets and uh, making sure that you, you know, you're applying the principle of least privileges to, to specific credentials, then there's all kinds of uh, policy companies that are out there and companies that have very, very specific types of policies, such as privileged access management. And even, Tim, this is a subject that you and I talk about quite a lot, uh, which is VPN. Yeah. And of course, a, a lot of very, very modern VPN replacement software, such as software divine perimeter. Um, all of these players in the industry have a piece of how to implement these principles. I think that what you're seeing in this presentation is probably the most horizontal across all of these, because what all of those things we just talked about have in common, Tim, is all of them have digital identities underneath all of them. Yeah. And we're going to get into it in a, in a few more slides, but other guidance documents on zero trust architecture and principles talk a lot about digital identities as being foundational. And that's something else we're going to get into. But I think, Tim, what we're going to start yeah. is what what are the the set of principles? Where does this come from? and where do digital identities fit in? That's I think that's where we're going to we're going to start with on this slide. All right. So so where do they come from? <laughs> let's talk, let's yeah. Let's go high level first. What, what let's talk about the ZTNA principles. At a high sure, level. sure, Tim. You know, I try to boil down because if you read about zero trust from right. anybody, right? They're gonna they're gonna give you you know obviously their piece of the world and. I, and it could get really confusing. I mean, is is zero trust a, 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 a merely a, a VPN replacement? Is it yeah. a uh, is it a firewall? Like what's going on here? I, I think really, if if you try to distill what the heck is zero trust as a set of security principles, it's the idea that you should really, really try to trust. Nothing. Yes, <laughs> in, other yes. in, in other words, in other words, we've we've for too long. If it's behind the firewall, if it's in your enterprise corporate network, you're over trusting it. Yeah. So the principle of least privilege is the key here, Jay. Right. I mean, the principle of least privilege states that basically for any uh, 
what do I want to call it, digital actor inside of your environment, they should be allowed only to do the things that they must be allowed to do. And that should be established definitively that, that this, this is the actor that has those privileges. And that helps in a lot of ways, right? It helps fight lateral movement inside the organization. It, it, it prevents, um, you know, just uh, uh, employees, rogue employees from doing things they shouldn't do. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the most basic idea. That's why we call it zero trust is nobody is trusted with anything. That's right, Tim. I think what, I mean, the principle of least privileges has been around right. for, well, I mean, forever, <laughs> for a yeah. very, very, very long time. And I think that the one of the big problems that we've had with that is we still, still over trusted, even though we knew that was a, a, <laughs> one of the ways to, to yield great security within our networks. The problem is we still over trusted within our networks. And I, we're going to get into some examples of some shoes that have dropped in the past little while that have really driven home the point of, and, th and this is why I think a lot of people who roll their eyes at, you know, another marketing buzz term, zero trust, when it's actually just an older idea of the principal least privileges, I, I would like to be in the camp of, I like the term zero trust because it gets more to the point of, yeah. guys, we've had the principle of least privileges for an awfully long time. We need to think of it though, as zero trust rather than the way it's been working for the past 20 plus years. And, and so Jay, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead in the deck, but I would put it to you that one of the main reasons that we have over trusted is people did not really have a clear technology roadmap of how to pin those principles down. Screw uh, what do I want to say. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, screw those principles down to the, to the full degree that they were able to. I'm going to agree with you, Tim. I, I think that especially because of the fact that digital identities are foundational in this, in other words, right. very strong authentication, it's just so darn important. How do you deal with both human and device identities in zero trust to, to perform strong authentication, even inside of your enterprise network? How did you deal with that proliferation of identities in the past? It might've been difficult. And so, you know, I, I don't want to give everybody a hall pass and saying, look, what you were doing 15 years ago, five years ago, uh, could you have done it better? Yeah, you probably could have, but it would have been a lot more difficult than it is now. So the, the barriers to these principles are much, much less than they ever were. That's why we're talking about the subject today. Okay, great. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, Tim, go ahead. I was just going to say, so do we want to move forward or? I think, Tim, that, uh, you know, I, I think we've already covered the fact that PKI is foundational. The reason for that is because of the fact that it's it's the 30-year technology that's proven reliable. It's utterly ubiquitous yeah. in dealing with the proliferation of digital identities. So th that's the connection to this idea that we were just talking about. Yeah, and full, fully versatile, fully flexible. Like every scenario you're talking about, a server, a client device, an IoT device, a, 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 an, a, a, you know, a human that's logging in, a BYOD device, uh, a process, a container, all of those things are PKI accessible. PKI can work in all of those use cases. And as we were just talking about, Tim, yeah. Yeah. You know, if five years ago, 10 years ago, PKI was typically very, very ensconced in the world of finance, uh, you know, passport systems, things like that. And, and they were very, 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 very generally built for those purposes. Whereas now, uh, scaling problems with IoT, that's been solved. Timing problems and scaling problems of DevOps identities, that's now been solved. Uh, things even as as far as solving the escrow problems uh, in around S MIME certificates, that's been solved. So our industry has really upped the ante in terms of being able to to take a reliable identity technology such as PKI and make it apply uh, 
to the world of zero trust network architecture to be able to deal with those that proliferation of identities problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. Uh, Thanks, Tim. So I'm going to hit the button here, move mm -hmm. forward, and I, this is this is really important to to really understand. You know, I don't want it to just be you and I touting the fact that hey, we're a PKI company, uh, and therefore digital identities are important in zero trust. Th this is coming from some of the smartest people in the industry. Uh, NIST, uh, the February 2020 guidance on zero trust network architecture. I would say anybody who's listening to this webinar really does need to, to go and get that related document that we're, that we're talking about here. The zero trust net architecture report where they basically describe PKI as an essential foundational component to zero trust architecture. And the reason they say that, Tim, is because they do recognize if you're going to be doing strong authentication yeah. with so many more devices and people than you have been in the past, you need to be able to manage that proliferation of digital identities in the enterprise network. There's more, way more than you ever had to deal with. You cannot deal with it the same way that you were dealing with your SSL certificates in the public trust realm. For example, if you were just, hey, having a, a spreadsheet of the, the, you know, the X number of certificates that you might have been uh, having to deal with renewal. You really, you don't, you no longer have a choice of being able to manage your digital identities when every single Docker container that you are operating right. in, in your Kubernetes cluster, for example, thousands and thousands of, of, of containers potentially all needing their own PKI certificate you can no longer do that manually. That has to be automated and it has to be connected to your governance. And that's what PKI has been giving you for the past 30 years in such a reliable way. And of course, Gartner, I'll just read off their quote as well. In a world of cloud-based users and devices, accessing public cloud-based services, the relevance of the legacy enterprise perimeter declines. Identity is the new perimeter. And I love yep. that point that they're making, Tim, because of the fact that when we talk about a digital identity, we're now talking about the new concept of, of atomicizing or making the perimeter and at the atomic level, what we are now trying to protect is the digital identity. And I, what I'm gonna offer, Tim, is one of the huge changes that has happened. Uh, I mean, Windows 11, right? Uh, we, we, you and I have podcast on the subject. Uh, I think that uh, anybody listening to this webinar needs to know a big, big change to Windows 11. You, you no longer can run Windows 11 without a TPM chip, which right. is providing hardware level protection to that digital identity. In other words, identity is the new perimeter. And even the way that we're building computers today, that includes mobile devices, laptops, IOT devices, et cetera. Identity is the new perimeter. It's it's foundational in everything we're talking about here. Yeah. So Tim, I think we covered yeah. a bit of this uh, in the first slide, mainly because you can't get around it. Uh, for, for those of you who, who might be looking at zero trust network architecture and saying to yourself, hey, didn't this used to just be called the principle of least privileges? Yeah, absolutely. You, you're right. There's no question. But I think one of the one of the things that's that's pointed out on this slide that I like is the the streamlining of compliance and auditing. For those of you who have been looking at things like privileged access management, you already know that being able to to bring in this the, the set of these principles under zero trust and really truly not trusting anything. Uh, really has to be aligned with your compliance and your auditing. I think that as you make highly privileged credentials more and more difficult for the attacker to get a hold of, you are doing what we're saying, the reasons why. You are reducing the attack service. You're stopping the spread of malware because in a world where credentials are just kind of floating around the network, whether they're being passed in the clear and not being encrypted with an SSL type session, 
whether you are vulnerable because of the fact that you're not using a, a passwordless re regime, perhaps you're struggling with uh, MFA, asking yourself, why, why does why does my multi-factor authentication scheme not work with my purely headless device? Well, your right. headless device doesn't understand what MFA is, right? Th right? These are all challenges to the why you couldn't enact the principle of least privileges in the past. And this is what's changed and why we now are, are increasingly calling all of this zero trust. So let's dive into that just a little bit further. So Tim, it's, it's not a too difficult of a subject, even though it's every time I talk to, to a, a customer, sometimes this comes up where they think about strong authentication. And they, they've been living in a world where passwords have just been around literally forever. And in the human, when it was just purely human beings, what you would do in order to enhance the security of a multi-factor authentication scenario to enact stronger authentication, you just right. hand them an OTP scheme of some kind, whether it's coming in through SMS, which has now been deprecated, or you're using a soft token application, right? There's all kinds right. of ways to do multi-factor authentication. And hallelujah, because it did make an impact because of the fact that it made the job of the bad guy just that much more difficult. Problem is this, it doesn't really work well with headless devices. You really, really ought not to be handing over passwords and hard coding them into Docker containers. Right. They need a, a, a form factor of credential where passwords no longer exist. In other words, the big driver towards using certificate-based digital identities and credential and those kinds of credentials is because we're now dealing with a mixed world of both humans and devices. And what I'm going to argue, Tim, is that if you take a look at the pandemic that has just happened, the difficulties in enabling a lot of MFA schemes to remote employees that have obviously proliferated, the proliferation of also other types of non-human devices, whether it's you know everything from robotic process automation to DevOps to IoT to even just server to server chatter. If you're going to be doing zero trust network architecture, you're not just going to be doing network segmentation. You want to be able to traverse hostile network boundaries with a strong authenticator you're going to be doing that with people. You're going to be doing that with devices. Yep. Therefore, you want to standardize on the strongest digital identity possible. That's typically going to be a PKI certificate. And so if you're going to be doing strong authentic authentication between all entities, MFA is simply not going to cut it. And I think that's the point we're trying to make here, Tim. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of places where it's not even not going to cut it. It's just not even... It couldn't. It's it's just not even connected to the actual connection you're trying to make, right? I, yeah. No, you you've absolutely got it, Tim. So let's let's move on to even in a world where we're, we're so used to the stealing of usernames and passwords, mm -hmm. what else has been happening? And and Tim, th this is probably I love this slide. Because it, these are very recent events, especially the Microsoft Exchange of vulnerability and the SolarWinds vulnerability that led to the bad guys didn't even need to steal a credential. They, they stole credentials after they established themselves on the beachhead of these vulnerabilities. A lot of CIOs that I've talked to over the years, a lot of security architects basically said, listen, if it's behind my firewall, it's closer to me. Therefore, it's simply more secure by default. Yeah. That is a terrible, terrible assumption. <laughs> um, let me put it this way. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about the Maginot line, but Paris being like the heart of France back in World War I, um, was no more protected because it was considered closer to the heart of France than <laughs> once the Germans were able to cross that Maginot line and bypass it, 
Paris was quite easily taken. And I think this is exactly what we're trying to say here, which is when you had on-premise appliances running Microsoft Exchange, running SolarWinds, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of an example here. Kevin Mandia was on TV talking about how his company discovered SolarWinds. And by his company, I mean mm -hmm. FireEye and, and Mandiant, right? Yeah. These are some of the smartest people in the industry when it comes to cybersecurity. And apparently they were having a meeting. Uh, they were in a boardroom and some of their network analysts came into the room and stopped the meeting and said, hey, we think we're under attack, but we have no idea where the bad guy's getting in from. Well, these are the smartest people in the world. So they, they jumped on the problem and they scratched their heads. Kevin Mandia talked about, you know, it took them a little bit of time before they realized it was a trusted security appliance that had a vulnerability, which led to being able to give the bad guys a beachhead. And so therefore it, it just proves even Kevin Mandia's team. Yeah. It, it basically over trusted systems within their enterprise network. And it led them to scratch their head because how in the world would the bad guy ever get in this close to us? Well, it didn't even require a username or password. It, in other words, it didn't require social engineering, which quite often, Tim, is the way that bad guys are getting in. It only required a vulnerability at the software level for appliances that were deeply ensconced within the trusted network segment. Right. And I think folks, if you want to understand why the principle of least privileges and why the term zero trust, I, I'm, I'm almost glad that these events have happened because I cannot think of a better example of why we have to employ these new principles and have stronger authenticators and therefore stronger forms of digital identity within our enterprise networks. Right. And, and the point is, if you think about solar winds, for instance, the point is, and this is here in the bullets that, you know, solar, the solar winds vulnerability provided the entry point, but then once they were in, they then moved laterally through the network and searched, hunted for information, created backdoors, gave themselves permissions, did all kinds of activities inside these tens of thousands of enterprises that they had a, a door open to because of solar winds. And in principle, all of those act activities with a sufficiently rigorous, with a sufficiently locked down zero trust permissions scheme, I may not be using quite the right words there, then all, in principle, all of those activities could have been simply blocked. You know, you, you, you come in through the front door, but you're not allowed to move inside of the building. And so you can't really do those things or you're not allowed to take actions because you don't have the permissions to make that movement or take those actions or view that information you once know, Tim, you're inside. It wasn't that long ago where we used to call that the attacker's kill chain, right? Yeah. Because, because in order to achieve an objective, the attacker needed a, 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 a bridgehead of some kind. Yeah. They, need, they needed to be able to establish themselves and persist themselves. And that's what these vulnerabilities allowed. And after that, the rest of the kill chain had to do with the fact that the bad guys were able to escalate privileges, move laterally, and they were doing that with digital identities. And those digital identities were weak authenticators shared secret types such as username and passwords, including MFA, by the way. And by the way, just, just for those of you interested, only because this slide was written before this event that I'm going to be about to mention, but for those of you who are following the most recent uh, cybersecurity attacks on Microsoft Printer Spooler, mm -hmm. I would actually add that attack to this list. And yeah. that's how recent it is. It's just another beachhead that the bad guy was able to establish themselves inside your corporate network. Therefore, don't trust anything in your enterprise network. That's just that's just the way we have to to move forward.
So and not to put a too fine a point on this, Jay, and sorry if I'm dumbing this down too much, but the basic idea, and maybe you're getting, I think maybe you're getting to that right here, but the basic idea is quite simply that even if I come in through a door that's not supposed to be there, soon as I try to, let's say, take a file, right, read a file, then I, we're going to look at my identity and say, are you on the list of, of identities that's allowed to read this file? If the answer is no, okay, can't read it. And yeah. and it's just that simple, right, Jay? You know what, Tim? I, I love I love where you're trying to go with this. You're really trying to bring it down to the to first principles and as you say, dumb it down. Let me dumb down this slide to the most important idea that you need to take away, which is now we know that zero trust as an idea, set of principles is important to us. You can't boil the ocean. But the one thing that you're having to do in the modern enterprise is cross a lot of network boundaries. In other words, with after the pandemic, you have a lot of people working from home. You have a lot of people yeah. working from, you know, who knows, maybe down the road, we'll go back to going back to airports and coffee shops. Again, hostile network boundaries. Uh, you might have hybrid cloud setups where you have on-premise systems interacting with uh, public cloud systems. I mean, it, Tim, you you and I are both old enough to remember when everything was just a, you know, one stack of technology, which was typically Microsoft based, and everything was that you interacted with was probably sitting behind uh, a, a door that was air conditioned in a in a server room, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everything was in one place. Well, we, we no, absolutely no longer live in that world you are crossing hostile network boundaries a lot. And in fact, another hostile network boundary should be that enterprise network behind that closed door with the air conditioning. And so therefore, how do you safely cross network boundaries? You have to think about every single entity, every single node as having its it's its own perimeter that needs to be protected. In other words, yeah. think about every single th interaction on your network as inherently crossing network boundaries, regardless of where it is, yeah. and then protect the digital identity that's doing the strong authentication. That's the takeaway to this. Yeah. Okay. Um, and okay, great. Go on. So, so in, you know, again, uh, I think, it's, it can be very overwhelming. It's almost simple to say, but why hasn't it happened, right, Tim? Like we, we talked earlier about the fact that PKI five, 10 years ago was more difficult than it is today. Um, other, there are other aspects to doing things such as network segmentation, uh, rule sets on your firewall, uh, even things like policy engines that never even existed before. There's a whole pile of technologies now that have grown into being able to deliver zero trust network architecture. But where do you start? And I think that you really, really need to start thinking about certificate-based authentication. In other words, end certificates for mobile devices, for laptops, for any form of human authentication that you're doing within your enterprise. Obviously, you're going to have legacy systems that you're going to have to think about. But the beauty of once you have your inventory, once you mm -hmm. have that inventory of where are you doing authentications, especially where are you doing authentication that is legacy, where maybe you can't bring a cert to the party. Well, then maybe that's where you need to define your policy engines, and maybe that's where you need to put an extra firewall or at least some form of network segmentation, right? In other words, I think number one is in any form of security, you need to start taking inventory. And what are you taking inventory of? What we're suggesting here is step one, take inventory of all of your authentications. And wherever you can, start working with digital certificate form factors such as PKI certificates. It just, it, it trust me, it, it's going to make your, your users happier because they don't have to remember passwords. They don't have to deal with MFA. You don't have to, to push that out. It's just a better way of doing things. And in systems that can't, 
obviously then you can start to do your, you know, bring in other forms of security to, to draw, draw the line to make those systems hardened compared to where they were in the past. Again, number two, I think is another form of inventory taking exercise, which is what are all the nodes? So now that you have all your authentication categories taken into account, this is, this is a, another challenge for you, which is what are all the, the nodes on your network? Where, where do they exist? What, what are the network boundaries that you're crossing? And all of those nodes are going to need digital identities, as we've said. And so therefore, the final bullet point on that middle part invest in a single pane of glass view of all certificate mm -hmm. resources. Tim, that even includes your world from public trust. In that includes SSL certificates, right? Sure. hundred percent. And again, I, I've, I think I've touched on this already, but for legacy systems, you know, yeah, I mean, the second bullet yeah. point time to deprecate, that's obviously the obvious one. It, it might make you more secure. You might ask yourself, hey, do I really need to have Microsoft Exchange on premise, does that make me feel warm and fuzzy anymore? <laughs> it, it shouldn't. Let's put it this way. But but this is where I I tip the hat and I give the nod to when when you're reading about software defined perimeters and, and VPN replacements, when you're reading about cooled firewall technologies, when you're reading about policy engines, the, the stuff that's not necessarily the pure PKI stuff. This is where you can start employing those vendors tools to to basically draw boundaries around your legacy systems where you know that you can't be doing the strongest authentications possible. I hope that's clear too. Yeah, I think so. And and your your Microsoft Exchange example is an interesting one. And we talked about this on our podcast, right? The point behind that was, you know, if I'm using Exchange in the cloud as a cloud service versus I I'm using Exchange on premise, the advantage for me of a cloud service is that no lateral movement is required is, or is 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 possible so even in the event you know there's this exchange vulnerability and you know the bad guys can jump on that and so maybe they can do certain things that directly involve my exchange maybe they can send some emails or read my emails and that's bad but what they can't do is they can't move into other parts of my environment and that's an example of isolating and that's what yeah. you're talking about that's right, Tim, be, because crossing the technological barrier of the cloud, in other words, deeply ensconcing your, uh, you know, your legacy CRM systems and your email systems in the cloud, you're taking advantage of hypervisor technologies that you might not necessarily be an expert in, but the people who run those public clouds, they're, they're an expert in protecting that. So you're taking right. advantage of of that form of isolation technology without yourself having to become an expert in it. It's kind of like a win-win. Yeah. All right, Tim. And, and you know, the elephant in the room being right. the pandemic, right, Tim? Yeah. And we, we, we've touched on this, right? That none of these things was new. Like, like to your point, if we all go back in time to January of 2020, or, or 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 November of 2019, let's say, there was no um, these needs were still here, these vulnerabilities were still here, these approaches were still here. But what happened with the pandemic is all of a sudden the the degree to which they those doors were open to the bad guys just increased exponentially. Instead of having at any given time a single digit percentage of my employees accessing accessing my critical information and systems from outside the physical boundaries of my office space suddenly it was a single digit percentage of employees that were inside the physical boundaries of my office space and this all literally happened like in a in a course of a week and it 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 just increased the attack surface tremendously. No, it certainly did, Tim. And and I just want to add this as, in terms of pain points of the pandemic. None of you have to admit it, but almost all of you or all of you had to deal with a workforce that was now working in a hostile environment. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I 
saw the pain on the, the network boards. Those of you who are, are the, the network administrators know this. Those of you who have network administrators working for you, <laughs> buy your administrator a beverage and, and get the real story because when the entire workforce had to move out, the pain of those weaker legacy forms of multi-factor authentication, Tim, they were far more fragile and harder to roll out than anybody thought at, at scale. And yeah. that was a major, major catalyst for using better form factors within for digital identities. So, yes, you know, Tim, I, I think we're just going to use this example one more time. For those of you who've never heard this example, uh, I, I'm going to give it here, which is back in, it's just funny how we always get, get into history lessons, Tim, it's just because I think, I think if we look to the past, these lessons have been learned before. Yeah. Uh, obviously, th there was this terrible event, it was called World War I, and France really felt that they were not defended uh, well enough. So they, they ended up spending an enormous amount of effort, resources on building probably one of the world's greatest defensive lines. Uh, called the Maginot Line, which was a yeah. was supposed to be impenetrable uh, across a very large portion of the the, the, Fran the France and German boundary. What ended up happening in World War II was that Germany's Blitzkrieg, which is you know something a lot of you, something that a lot of you have heard about, mm -hmm. they just completely bypassed the Maginot Line because of the fact that the northern boundary which included the Netherlands and, and Belgium were completely and utterly undefended to the point where there wasn't even reserve forces put into place by France, which led to the very quick takeover of France by Germany. I think the analogy, Tim, to the Microsoft exchange attack, the solar yeah. winds attack, and now more recently, even the, the Microsoft printer, printer spooler, spooler attack yeah. that those attacks, which are just overlooking trusted parts of our network, right? And France is overlooking of a trusted border. Yeah. I I, th I don't think you could get much of a better analogy. That Maginot Line analogy just gets better and better through time. Yeah, and then of course, once you're beyond the Maginot Line, there are no defenses at all, right? And that's that's the that's the non ZTNA approach in our analogy here here's an interesting one tim this is this is one that you can just imagine uh winston churchill was actually in paris at the point at which the Blitz, blitzkrieg had just began in in france and he asked general the generals in france so where are your reserves in other words where are your internal defenses let's put them into place and and basically build a new defensive line and the, the, the French generals looked at Churchill and said, we have no more defenses. That's it. And so th this is exactly the problem we have in our enterprise networks, Tim, as you said. Once the bad guys are in, that lateral movement is almost unimpeded, and you are in bad shape if that happens. Yeah. Yep. All right. So um, if you liked this talk... Jason and I run a podcast called Root Causes, a PKI and Security Podcast. We have more than 170 episodes published. We've been doing this for over two years. And um, you can go. We talk about all kinds of matters that touch PKI, digital certificates, encryption, uh, uh, and things along those lines. You can find us wherever you listen to your podcasts, and we would love to have you as a member of our audience. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Megan, do we have any questions? Yep, Tim, we got a few great questions. Okay. So first off, what exactly is hostile in my own enterprise network? Tim, well, if you don't mind. You don't I know, right? I mean, go, go, yeah, Jay, please take yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can tell you what. One of the things that's most hostile is this. If you have a bad guy that is persisting themselves somewhere inside your network, and so therefore there's going to be some node that and it, it could be your domain controller, it, it, which is that wouldn't that be terrifying? It could be uh, 
you know, a, a laptop in the HR department, which is access to do specific tasks. And it's, you know, it, perhaps it's updated on time, uh, perhaps it's not. The point being this, either the bad guy got in from a vulnerability or through social engineering, both work very, very well. Once the bad guy's inside that hostile network, there's a number of things that they can be doing. They can be key logging for passwords. They can be reading messages going across your, your network, which could be passwords in the clear. They could be, again, doing secondary social engineering. They could be lifting uh, Microsoft directory hashes out of LSAS memory. You know, it, I, I, I go into the weeds a little bit here, Tim, because all of those activities are part of how the bad guy starts to move laterally within the network. And where are the crown jewels in your enterprise network? Well, I bet you if you had a SolarWinds appliance or if you had an on-premise Microsoft Outlook or a Microsoft Exchange server, I, or you had a, a, you know, a, an Active Directory domain controller with a printer spooler turned on, for example, um, I guarantee that your crown jewels are a lot closer to where those things are within your enterprise network than you think. And so therefore, what would be the set of events that the bad guy would take? And I'm glad that question's asked because you remember, Tim, on one previous slide, we were talking a lot about taking inventory of your authentications, taking inventory of your nodes. This is another set of inventories perhaps you should be taking, which is not just what's hostile. Flip, flip that question around and then ask the question, what are the hostile events that could happen that would move from a, what are the steps of events? What are the what are the necessary lateral movements between potentially vulnerable nodes in my network and my crown jewels? I think that once you become an advanced and mature organization from a security standpoint, that's when you're doing zero trust really well. Okay, next question. What about this, if anything, is beyond privilege access management? I think that's an interesting question. I think anybody who's asking that question is pro has probably spent a lot of money <laughs> on a vendor solution, such as privileged access management. And, and I'll, I would say this, it doesn't necessarily take an administrator credential to start to escalate privileges up to administrative privileges. In, in fact, Tim, I was just reading over the weekend, uh -huh. um, Benjamin Delpy, who create, who's a white hat researcher, who found a flaw in a recent update to Windows, which allowed free escalation from a normal, let's say, HR user or finance user mm. up to admin with by simply changing a file, which in previous versions of Windows, that file was inex inaccessible. So Microsoft introduced a vulnerability, which made your HR user's credential just as dangerous as your IT domain, domain controller administrator. So therefore, if you're running PAM, Privileged Access Management Software, good for you. That's fantastic. That investment has probably paid off in spades. What I'm trying to say is it's probably insufficient. Right. These digital identities you refer to are related to both humans and devices. How do I provision across the board? Wow, uh, Tim, we could have two webinars on that alone. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the quickest way for me to answer that is this is where PKI has really stepped up a, as an ecosystem of technologies uh, because there are a lot of provisioning technologies that have been now brought to bear. Uh, IoT devices with uh, enrollment over secure transport, uh, mobile devices, obviously, with SCEP and various MDMs. Uh, Tim, in your world in public trust, you, you know a lot about the ACME protocol. Yep. Uh, these are ways to automate 
the delivery of digital identities to where they need to be. And, and this is something we didn't touch on in this webinar, but that whole suite of technologies is something that I'm really proud of as, as an industry where we've really stepped up to make it really easy, uh, or at least a lot easier than it used to be to get the certificates to where they need to be. This will be the last question for today. I am running Microsoft CA and I can't replace it. What can I do to participate in these security principles? <laughs> what, what? That's a good one. Uh, I can tell you, what you need is an abstraction layer. In other words, I don't think in the PKI industry we're going to be able to ask you to to basically rip and replace that that very ensconced CA that's been around for such a long time. The problem is, Tim, take a look at on-premise problems with Microsoft technologies from Exchange to the printer spooler on the domain controller, problems with security around the hashes of Active Directory. Well, why wouldn't Microsoft CA also be beholden to very similar problems? Again, the... I, uh, the company I work for, uh, Sectigo, we, we've worked very, very hard at building that abstraction layer on top of M Microsoft CA in order to be able to bring digital identities that are issued from that CA into the realm of being able to be used by more modern uh, provisioning technologies so that you can take those identities, those digital, digital certificates, and start using them in stacks of technology that Microsoft had never dreamed of, such as Android, iOS, IoT devices, DevOps, etc. So, uh, again, that could be a whole webinar in itself, but I but I think that's uh, that's the quickest answer I can give. That's it for questions. As always, thank you, Tim and Jason, thank and you thank, you, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll be sharing today's webinar recording tomorrow, so be on the lookout. Thanks again.